Week in Review, November 7th, 2022. I'm going to start with, I'm not going to go, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not going to go through all the comments. I'm going to start with this comment. <clears throat> Jody Lynn, uh, big fan here, but honestly, this is so boring. I just can't. Um, I, I agree with you. I, I don't like the direction it's going and the format, so I'm going to, I'm going to mix it up a little and do things differently. One of the first things I'm going to do is I'm not going to go through all the comments. In the beginning when I was doing these, I wasn't going through all the comments. Then I started doing that. Now I'm going to just go through a few select comments. And I'm not going to go over everything I did in the last week. But So let's keep going. This comment, though, I do want to address. Thanks for doing these. Um, I was wondering if you had a suitable alternative to the ultras that fell apart on you. So I'm experimenting with a bunch of different shoes now because the ultras, as you saw in a, in a different video I did, did fall apart on me catastrophically, I think, um, during a big adventure race. So I'm trying um, a few other brands to include Solomon and another brand called Topo. I think I'm going to experiment with Hoka. And I just interest, or I just recently saw, unrelated to those trail and hiking shoes, but this whole carbon fiber plate trend in running shoes over the past four or five years. And I'm going to start... Um, I'm going to get a pair of those and start running and, and experiment. If you have any knowledge of that trend, um, leave a comment. So working on finding a new set of shoes that I, that I like for, for hiking and for um, rucking in, in really rough terrain, let's say. Okay, so Molly asked, why should we not sprint as we age? Risk of injury too high. What should we do to mimic that intensity stimulus? So... <clears throat> The risk of injury for, for, for all-out sprints, yes, for athletes, especially as we age, is, um, is very high. And a couple points to that. The, um, when I say sprint, the 400 meters in Helen doesn't count as a sprint. That's a 400-meter run. Even the 200 meters in um, a given triplet or... Um, the 100 meters in, we had a workout called SQT once. I had 50 down and back that had, was paired up with some snatches. So let's say even hundreds or fifties that are paired up in a classic CrossFit style, like a triplet or a couplet, um, those fifties and hundreds, especially in a continuous effort are not too big of a concern for what I'm talking about. Why I say in a continuous effort is because if you were to do it where maybe you have fixed rest and you're able to go all out on the sprint, maybe it's um, sprint 50 meters, 10 snatches, rest three minutes, five rounds per time, that might be what I'm talking about. And I'll tell you what I'm talking about now. What I'm talking about is all out sprinting efforts of, of 20 to 100 meters, even 200 meters um, with rest, and, and just going as hard as you can um, over and over, you know, five 100s, five 40s, six, seven 40s, something like that. And here's why. Um, the stress and the demands on the musculature, specifically on the hammies, in that high turnover, dynamic, repeated effort is greater than, as, especially as we get older, than what we prepare our bodies for. The, the athletes who sprint on a regular basis, um, uh, sprinters, you could even say some ball sports athletes, those guys warm up and train specifically for those efforts for all of their uh, training and through years of preparation for those events, meaning they, they started as kids, came through the system, came through the the necessary training, um, benchmarks, pipeline, et cetera, in those sports. And they spend 30, 40 minutes, an hour long, warming up, stretching, sport-specific training, layered on with days of that, weeks of that, years of that. And, and their bodies are well-prepared and conditioned to those demands. We as CrossFitters, especially as we age, especially as, and I'm, I'm not talking about games athletes, or I'm not talking about people who get really competitive in that aspect of it, because th they're going to sprint, and they also spend basically their 
entire um, existence at this stage, training. I'm talking about the people like me, like a lot of you listening, who go into the gym for one hour a day, three to five days a week, and you do that year after year over and over, which is a great thing. So you doing that is great for GPP and great for fitness, but if you've been doing that for two or three months and then some sprints come up and you warm, even if you warm up for 30, 45 minutes um, and then you go off and you do some hardcore sprints, I just, you are at risk of, um, of essentially pulling your hamstring because it's, it's something we don't prepare for on a regular basis. So I've seen also people blow Achilles. I've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of injuries where people try all out sprinting without um, having a good enough foundation. And even when you look at athletes, uh, even in the pro sports, football, I just saw someone this past weekend or the weekend before pull a hamstring because he was sprinting and trying to keep up with someone. I mean, it's even common amongst those who do this for a living. So the reward for, uh, or the risk for the reward of that stimulus, I think is a little too, too high. Um, I think it is worth, if you do have a sprint day at your affiliate or at your gym, or if you're do, doing something like that, maybe you self-regulate for self-preservation. That's what I do. Actually, good point. We were in Santa Cruz a few months ago, and we had a, they had some sprinting in the workout. And it was actually what I was talking about in the beginning. It was sprint all out into some wall walls and some other things. And Gary pulled up. He pulled his, I think I already mentioned this, but I'll talk about it again. He pulled his hamstring. And I very deliberately was like, I am not running 100% on these runs at this point. There is no reason to do that. And so I was going at like 75 or 80%. Years ago, we had an event in Florida at the uh, in Bradenton at the IMG Academy, and uh, they took a bunch of CrossFit athletes. It's probably over a decade ago, so I was in my 30s. Through a, a combine, a combine 360, the combine 360 they called it, which incorporated elements of the NFL combine, and they had 40s in that. And um, I ended up pulling my hamstring there. Same sort of thing. Like, you know, I don't sprint a lot, warmed up really well. They took us through a very thorough warm up and um, ran one really, uh, which I thought was fast. And then I ran a second one, tried to go a little faster and pulled up. And for the last decade, that's been a lingering injury. About five years ago, I tried upping the sprinting again and um, re re injured it, not as bad as the first time. So I think you need to be really cautious, especially if you're getting into fitness, if you've been doing CrossFit for a few years, if you don't have a background or exposure in or with sprinting, you have to be really cautious with going all out on any given sprint. Specifically, again, sprints isolated from a CrossFit workout and sprints, sprints isolated from a CrossFit workout that are all out efforts. And typically, I'd say 200 or less. I, I think once you get past those distances, um, you can't generate enough speed to actually um, do much damage. So that's, uh, and so then your follow on was what should we do to mimic that intensity of stimulus? You just sprint, just go slower. Um, I still think running quickly, running fast is a great skill to have and something to do. But I think going, as I've talked about for the last six min minutes, all out, um, has the potential to be a recipe for disaster and set you back in training and in your day to day in a, in a massive way. For years, I had friends and people I worked with, uh, telling me I should read that was my pencil. I should read shoe dog by Phil Knight. And, um, there was no way I was ever going to read it because, um, Reebok was our partner, and I felt like, especially early in the, um, right around, when, well, actually, right around when the Metcon was coming out, it's so probably 12 or 13, we had a very um, kind of contentious relationship with Nike. At one point, someone, as they were getting ready, to, someone from Nike, I won't say his name, as they were getting ready to uh, debut the Metcon, actually threatened to sue me and CrossFit, sue me personally and CrossFit for blocking the Metcon from the games. We weren't doing that we were just um we were working with and acknowledging the fact that we had a title sponsor for the crossfit games anyways that's a different story 
and then throughout the years at the games, as we had this partner with Reebok, Nike would do like some guerrilla marketing, guerrilla campaigns, we'll call it, where they were posting up trucks outside the venues in Carson, putting billboards up, whatever. So, so I, to say the least, I wasn't a fan of Nike, and um, I had no interest in reading. And plus, let me back up, because I'm a very, like, um, once we have a partner, I'm going to be aligned with them for the most part, for most of the time. And so with Reebok, I was very, they treated us well. We were, um, we liked working with them. And so I was a Reebok guy and not, not a Nike guy. So I didn't read the book. Um, recently, Phil Knight's name popped up in media and I saw it on the news uh, for some political reasons in, in Oregon. And um, I decided, okay, his name popped up. I saw, it, saw him on a story. It reminded me of the book and I decided to pick it up and actually not read it, but listen to it. Those of you who listen to me on this a lot know that I am very, I have books I read and I have books I listen to. This was a book I listened to. And I actually loved the book. I thought it was a great book. I actually wish I would have physically read it. I still might one of these days. I really enjoyed listening to it. And I, I drive a lot all around the Bay Area, all around here, going from to, the, uh, to my house from the ranch multiple times a day, going to Santa Cruz now for meetings. So I'm in my car a lot. So I, I have the opportunity to listen to um, books a lot. And so I listened to this and um, really enjoyed it. The book is uh, really well written. And he, I thought it was going to be kind of one of those business books about like how great I am. Look at me as a leader. Look at me, Phil Knight. And look at all the great things I did. And look at how... Um, how brilliant I was in creating this massive global brand. And so that's kind of how I went in thinking it was going to be. And it was nothing like that. It was obviously about the very early days and the foundations of the company and his, his upbringing and his um, journey through college and how he got to the point where he created the company. And he was super humble and very um, open about the mistakes he made. And there was not a lot of ego at all like I thought there would be and it was really cool to listen to him be so open and so vulnerable with the um, his journey through it all and his mistakes and his not even um, you know being open about relationships and moves that they did and performances that he had that were what we'd call subpar or what he was calling basically subpar at times and um, it's one of those books where he's not preaching or telling you how to do things or telling you why he was right he was being very open about the journey and and it was super cool i give him praise for doing the book and i think um he he knocked it out of the park and it makes me a fan. You're not going to see me wearing Nikes anytime soon, but it does make me a fan of the brand and of him and the things he has done in that that industry. It's a uh, it's a pretty cool book. So I don't want to give it away give away any of the details, but I do. Even if you aren't a Nike fan, like I'm not, I do highly recommend it. There is a lot, and and in books like that where you're not being talked to or taught or lectured there are tons of opportunities to learn from their mistakes and experiences. And that's what I feel like this book, um, this book had a lot of that. There was a lot to learn from it. I also like that it was really, it focused on the early days of Nike and doesn't go through the entire history of Nike. And um, I like that aspect of it. I like the idea of um, focusing on the early days of the history of something I've been involved with, and maybe I'll do that eventually, but, but not yet. So Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, definitely worth the read or listen and um, pick it up if you want something to um, learn from and to take up some time over the holidays. Okay, final topic I'm going to talk about, and it's going to be driven from a comment. In a recent interview, you talked about how the CrossFit, average CrossFit 
CrossFitters are heavily in influenced by games athletes and their high carbohydrate intakes. You said the average CrossFitter would still be able to perform well with a lot less carbohydrate. Would love to hear more thoughts on this and what the potential benefits would be in taking less carbs. I'm currently interested in performance and building a bigger, stronger physique. So the nutrition, this aspect and this um, call it recommendations in CrossFit has been very hotly debated for decades. I've been with CrossFit now for almost two decades and there's always, even within CrossFit, it seems like the latest trend, the latest thing and different recommendations and different paleo, keto, zone, but really and heavily influenced by athletes. But let me even back up. When I first started with CrossFit and getting involved with CrossFit, uh, I realized very quickly, and especially spending time with Greg and learning from him and going to the level one, that CrossFit prescribed a lower carb prescription than the typical American diet. Typical American diet, you could say 50% or more carbs. The CrossFit prescription was largely based off of the zone diet, and that's 40% uh, carbs, 30% protein, 30% fat. And so that was our prescription, our baseline prescription to start off of, which was a lower carb. I wouldn't call the zone, especially these days, a low carb diet, but it was definitely lower carb than traditional diets, traditional American diet. And that was very popular and very utilized, especially by CrossFit staff and seminar staff and affiliate owners and those close to the circle in the early days um, for years, for decades, maybe even, for at least a decade. And people still, amongst our team, still zone um, and utilize the diet. And a couple notes on that. One of the reasons why it was so utilized and so effective, so recommended, was because it was so effective. With this methodology and this program, we measure our weights, we measure our times, we keep track of our loads. Well, it also makes sense then if you're trying to optimize performance to measure your intake and to measure your intake via the macronutrients, carbohydrate, protein, and fat and play around with that. Well, in those early days of people being really into fitness, people still are, but uh, a lot of us being really into fitness and seeing what was best for us, when people used a lower carb and a zone-like prescription, we saw performance mostly, most of the time, optimized. Now, there were some, uh, there were um, areas and places where it was necessary to increase fat. And essentially, when you were increasing the fat, that made your prescription even lower carb overall. And, and people saw great results with that. Then we had the paleo scene that became very popular. And, and that by nature became mostly low carb, even you could argue lower carb than um, zone. And then eventually the, the keto craze came and, and the keto thing was kicking, you know, uh, recommending less than 30, 40 carb, 40 grams of carb a day once you were fat adapted, but that took some time to get there. So all of that being said, um, with a prescription like that, where a traditional American diet and a traditional individual coming into a CrossFit box, they probably don't need more carbs than not. They need to have, especially if you're um, struggling with weight or have any, um, ha have any health issues, the, the default for a CrossFit trainer prescription should likely be um, lowering the carbohydrate and monitoring um, what, what that's doing to performance and their health as they go. Definitely within the last four or five, maybe even six years, and I'll say last four or five, six years, because there was a phase where people like Matt Chan, Spieler I think, but Matt Chan for sure, and some others were doing hardcore zone even while competing in the CrossFit games um, and, and modifying it again with fat, et cetera, and seeing great results. But it seems like within the last five, six years, especially the last two or three years, um, a lot of athletes, games athletes, have gone super high carb, like super high carb relative to everything I just talked about. And they're using a lot of carbohydrate to fuel their efforts. Um, 
a lot of protein and a decent amount of fat. And they are seeing very good results for themselves with those prescriptions. It's funny because last few years when I've, I've tested with a lot of athletes here for the games, for games workouts or any workouts, I always ask them about their, their uh, um, carbohydrate or, or their macronutrient breakdown, how they're eating. And th there's female athletes who, you know, over 200 grams of carbs, 120 grams of, um, of protein, and, you know, like 100 grams of fat. That, I would say, is a, is a high-carb diet. And a lot of these athletes eat very high-carb diets. And the thing is, so they um, kind of celebrate, show it off on their Instagram, and they're very vocal about how they eat and that it works for them. But that's the thing. So you have to understand that context. These guys are also, a lot of them, training um, four to five times a day, five to six hours a day, every day of the week, very minimal rest, um, multiple sessions back to back to back. We, as an average CrossFitter, as a person just doing this for fitness, are not training at the volumes and the loads and the duration that those athletes are. A lot of us are going into classes one hour class a day, or if you're training in your garage, maybe you're only training for 30 minutes a day. And I think a lot of people, this is my, I contend that a lot of people who see them eat the way they eat use it as an excuse to eat to, to eat the same things, but because we train very differently and don't have the foundation, fitness foundation, um, volume foundation, solidified that those athletes do, it's, um, it's the wrong prescription. So I think CrossFit, HQ, in our education and, and our voices, we need to do a better job of saying, okay, what they're doing is working for them, but they're also very unique. What we need to do, what the average CrossFitter needs to do, what the 99% of the world needs to do, CrossFitters, 99% of CrossFitters, is not what the games athletes or the athletes are doing in terms of nutrition because they are training very differently with way more volume and intensity than, than we are. And so they can get away with that the average CrossFitter cannot. So all I'm trying to do by talking about this and highlighting it, highlighting it is just draw awareness to this fact that just because you see Tia or Brooke or the Buttery Bros, even though they're not elite CrossFitters, or people like that eating the way they do, doesn't mean um, it's also gonna work for you to see success with your health goals or your fitness goals in CrossFit. Also understand, I'm not saying don't eat like they do ever. I'm not saying don't ever eat a cake, don't ever have bread. Um, just understand that the, the high carbohydrate diet on a regular basis for most CrossFit athletes who are trying to A, lose weight, B, get healthy, or C, get fitter, probably is not a good prescription for those end states. So... Um, I have pretty um, strong feelings on that just because I don't want to see our community. There, there's so much influence by the games athletes on what the majority of the community members do. And I don't want to see them get steered in the wrong direction where results are slower, where um, maybe they're not dropping the pounds, maybe they're not getting as fast or strong as quickly as they could be. Okay, final thing. Um, I had a call with Joe DeSena and Don last week, so uh, we got some cool things coming up with Spartan. Not ready to announce yet, but a cool little experiment coming up, uh, coming up soon. So uh, stay tuned for that. Thanks for listening. I thought it'd be a lot shorter because I changed up the format, but it was still a long one. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Drop a comment in the comments.